This video is sponsored by Coursera. If you and I wanted to, let's say, pass notes in class, such that if anyone opened the note up, they would have no idea what it said, but we could still figure it out, there's several methods for doing this. For example, maybe beforehand we could agree on shifting all the letters by three in order to encrypt our message, otherwise known as the Caesar cipher. So if I wanted to say hello, I'd write a word with those same letters shifted by three. Instead of H, I'd write K, since K is one, two, three letters past H. Instead of E, I'd write H, L goes to O, and O goes to R. So this is the encrypted message that I send you. Then when you receive this note, all you do is shift the letters three to the left, and you get the original message back. But this is too simple, since someone could just try a bunch of shifts and figure out what the original message was. But hopefully you can see the foundations of cryptography are pretty simple. You have some message you want to send, or the plain text, like hello. And you encrypt this to create a bunch of gibberish, otherwise known as the cipher text that we saw earlier. This is then decrypted back to plain text, and this is what we just did using our specific encryption and decryption algorithm of shifting by three. But let's do something else instead. Let's come up with a secret word or key that will swap around the letters for us. For this scenario, let's just say our secret key is computer. And now I want to encrypt the message, you can trust me. Well, since the message is longer than the key, I'll just rewrite the key repeatedly until the end. And now what you do is really just add the letters. C is the third letter of the alphabet. So we gotta go three past Y. Now, since Y is at the end, all we do is wrap around back to A. So we go three letters past Y, wrap around and land at B. O is the 15th letter. If we add O or another 15, we get 30. And to figure out the letter more quickly, remember that Z is the 26th letter. So you could say 27 corresponds to A, 28 with B, which would make 30 go with D. And we can do this for the rest of the message to get our ciphertext. To decrypt it, you would just subtract by the secret key. Now that wrapping around we just saw is actually the start of the real math I'm gonna get into soon. So we just saw the 25th letter Y plus the third letter C gave us B, which is the second letter. But we really know that 25 plus three is in fact 28. In fact, we could say that 28 corresponds with two and we'll use this symbol to show that. But this works specifically for the 26 letter alphabet. And this is the same math you do as with the 12 hour clock. If it's 11 o'clock, disregarding AM or PM, what time will it be in three hours? Well, obviously it'll be two. But 11 plus 3 is really 14. So 14 corresponds with 2 on a 12 hour clock. Because just like with the alphabet, you wrap around to the beginning. Now, the official way to write and say all of this is 14 is congruent to 2 modulo 12. The visual way to think about this is if the integers continue to wrap around a clock, 14 and 2 would land at the same place. In fact, if we kept going, 26 would also land there which means 26 is congruent to 14, as well as two, modulo 12. Then algebraically, the reason 26 is congruent to two mod 12 is because if you subtract 26 and two, the result is divisible by 12. Or you can see that 20 is congruent to eight mod 12, since 20 minus eight is divisible by 12. Same goes for all these pairs of numbers on the clock. So this is where we're headed. And I'm going to get back to this soon, but this is the beginning of number theory, the main branch of mathematics used for cryptography. But first, the encryption we were just using is known as the Viginaire cipher, which was used during the 16th century. However, there's a problem with it though. If we used our secret key many times, like over hundreds of messages, an adversary could intercept those and using frequency analysis, they could eventually decipher what our original messages were. In the English language, the most popular letter is E, which comes up about 12.7% of the time. Next up is T, which comes up about 9.1%. Then A, which comes up about 8.1%, followed by O, and so on. I was curious about this, so I found an online frequency analysis tool and copied in the first chapter of Harry Potter. And the most popular letters corresponded pretty accurately. O and A were just a little mixed up, but yeah, using this, there are ways to crack the Viginaire cipher over many, many messages. You can see that having a key is important in cryptography. So now let's talk about key exchange, or how to establish a secret key when you have to exchange it with someone over a public channel. So I'll start this with a question. 
a friend and I want to share a secret key, or in this case, a secret number. Now, the problem is there's an eavesdropper who can see or hear anything that we say or write or whatever. Okay, literally anything. We can't use another language, we can't whisper to each other, nothing like that. And let's say it's a new friend, so you guys don't know much about each other. Now, the question is, is this task even possible to come up with a secret key that only you two can understand, but the eavesdropper cannot? We'll give that some thought, because now we've reached a point where we need the real math that I want to talk about, or number theory, aka the study of integers. So pop quiz, is 10 congruent to 6 modulo 4? Well, yes it is. Algebraically, it's because 10 minus 6 is divisible by 4. Visually, if I had a clock with only four numbers, and I just kept wrapping integers around it, 10 and 6 would land at the same location. And since 10 is 5 times 2, we can say that 5 times 2 is congruent to 6 mod 4. Which I know looks really weird, but now we're starting to do arithmetic within number theory. But now let's see what other type of arithmetic we can apply to this. Like, could I divide both sides by 2 and get 5 is congruent to 3 mod 4? Well, no, this is incorrect because 5 minus 3 is not divisible by 4. But why didn't that work? Well, the first equation says 10 minus 6 is divisible by 4. But what that actually means is 10 minus 6 equals 4 times some integer we'll call n. Now, we know this is true for some value n, in this case 1. But if I factor out a 2 from both terms, does this also mean that this part, the 5 minus 3, is also divisible by 4? Well, clearly that's not true, which means 5 is not congruent to 3 mod 4. And one way to think about this is that the prime factors of 4 are 2 and 2. And two of these 2s do not appear in either of these terms. It's the combination of these terms which lead to this. So none of these individually is divisible by 4. So that's why you can't just divide by 2 and have something that's correct. But look at this. 72 is congruent to 12 mod 15, which should be easy to see at this point. If I divide both sides by 2, I get 36 is congruent to 6 mod 15. And this, in fact, is also true, since 36 minus 6 is divisible by 15. So before we go further, let's just think about, is there some rule for when we can divide both sides? And of course the answer is yes. If the number that you're dividing and the modulus are relatively prime, then you're able to do the division. And relatively prime just means one is the only number that can go evenly into both. Like nine and 10 are relatively prime since nothing goes into both of them besides one. Same with 70 and 33. Another way to see it is the prime factorizations of let's say 70 and 33 have nothing in common. So we can say that from this equation, 72 minus 12 equals 15 times some integer n. If we factor out a 2, we get 2 times 36 minus 6 equals 15 times some integer n. Now you'll notice that the prime factors of 15 are 5 and 3, which means this side of the equation is going to be 5 times 3 times some other stuff, whatever n is. This side of the equation, therefore, also must contain 5 times 3 times some other stuff. And because 5 and 3 don't appear in this first term, since 2 and 15 are again relatively prime, then the 5 and the 3 must appear in this term. And in fact, 5 times 3 times 2 would get us what this is, 30. And that means that this term is divisible by 15 because it contains the factors 5 and 3. And that means that this equation does hold, because 36 minus 6 is divisible by 15. But hopefully you see we cannot divide both sides of this equation by 6 now and get 6 is congruent to 1 mod 15, because, well, this is obviously wrong, and 6 is not relatively prime to 15 since 3 goes into both of them. Now those are some of the basics, but there's so many theorems in this field that no one video could cover. But a lot of them show some really interesting relationships between numbers when it comes to like primes, divisibility, and so on. For example, if I pick a prime p and raise any integer to the p minus one, it will be congruent to one mod p. If we let p equal five and x equal two, 
we can see that two to the fourth or P minus one is congruent to one mod five. Since two to the fourth is 16, 16 minus one is 15, which is divisible by five. But instead, if P is, let's say, 113 and X is 18, I know that 18 to the 112, or P minus 1, is congruent to 1 mod 113. I have no idea what this number is, but I know that if I subtract 1 from it, that will be divisible by 113. There's another similar theorem, but to understand it, let me first ask this. How many integers less than or equal to 10 are relatively prime to 10? Well, there's one, three, seven, and nine. So there are four numbers. In number theory, this comes from Euler's totient function, which is written using phi of n. So phi of 10 is four, because there are four integers less than 10 that are relatively prime to 10. Another example could be phi of 15 is eight, because there are eight integers that are relatively prime to 15. Notice for a prime number that phi of p is always p minus one. And this is because nothing goes into a prime but one in itself. Like phi of seven would be six, since one, two, three, four, five, and six are all relatively prime to seven, a total of six numbers. So Euler came up with a more general theorem that said an integer x raised to the phi of some integer n is always congruent to one mod n, assuming that x and n are relatively prime. So if n is 15, we saw that phi of 15 is eight, meaning some integer, let's say 14 raised to the eighth power is congruent to one mod 15. Which I find really interesting because I don't know what this is, but I do know that if I subtract one, the result is divisible by 15. And remember that phi of some prime number p always equals p minus one. So if I use p for n here and then plug in p minus one up here, I get x to the p minus one is congruent to one mod p, which is the same as that theorem we saw earlier. Okay, so now we're ready to see this actually applied to cryptography, and we're gonna look at the Diffie-Hellman protocol. So this is how we're going to exchange a secret key with each other, such that an eavesdropper couldn't figure it out, or at least they'd have a very difficult time trying to figure it out, even if they had a computer. 